This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Uh, Rob Thompson from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Rob's uh, recognized around the world as an expert in the pathophysiology of aortic aneurysm disease based, uh, in, to his credit, largely on the basis of his own research over the last uh, 15 years. Rob's going to talk about uh, what we now know about the past physiology of abdominal aortic aneurysm disease based on his experience uh, with animal modeling. Rob, thanks for coming. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about aortic aneurysms in such a comprehensive way. Um, I'm going to focus today really on animal models and one in particular um, as an introduction to a new uh, or a different aspect of studying aneurysms, but really our fundamental questions remain the same. Uh, that's to understand why aneurysms form, why they grow, why they rupture, and taking a biomedical tack to understand the pathophysiology with the hope that this might lead to different and new forms of treatment. Um, our initial uh, endeavors uh, with aortic aneurysm disease uh, involved just looking at the basic histology. So here's your histology slides of uh, aneurysms. Uh, this is a normal aorta and an atherosclerotic aorta from the same area of the, the body that you get uh, infrarenal aneurysm in. And uh, you see the marked amount of mural thrombus, uh, which may come up in later discussions, uh, as well as the marked destruction of the aortic elastin. And another feature of the histology of aneurysms, which is pretty uniform, is the development of chronic inflammatory cell infiltration. So these are some of the basic features of the histology of aneurysms that were noted a long time ago uh, and have served to drive some of the basic uh, studies on pathophysiology of this disease. And it's notable that the changes in aneurysm disease are transmural. They're not just intimal as is atherosclerosis, but they really involve the entire wall of the aorta. And aneurysm disease is really not a single step disease. It's a vicious cycle. Once uh, the disease begins uh, at some point in this circle uh, with dilatation as the marker that we identify clinically, uh, there are a variety of different effects that uh, serve to positively reinforce the further progression of disease. So many of our studies in animal models are based on trying to reproduce uh, this vicious cycle and also the initiating uh, events. We know from studies in human tissues that uh, enzymes that degrade elastin and collagen are likely <coughs> important. This is one of the earliest hypotheses about the pathophysiology of aortic aneurysms. And matrix metalloproteinases uh, the family uh, represented by these protein domain structures uh, is a group of enzymes that are capable of degrading elastin and collagen, and really the only family of enzymes capable of degrading these very durable fibrous matrix protein components. So a lot of the early attention in human aneurysm tissue is identifying MMPs and whether they're elevated, uh, and MMP9, the largest of this family, uh, emerged as uh, an enzyme that was markedly elevated in human aneurysm tissue, and you can see an example zymogram here showing the marked increase in MMP9 from these tissues and the immunolocalization of MMP9 uh, with antibodies to inflammatory cells. So the notion that macrophages in particular produced MMP9 and that that led to aneurysm disease was one of the early pathophysiologic hypotheses that when we developed animal models, we hoped to explore in a more mechanistic manner. You can see also the MMP9 is elevated in the plasma in the circulating blood of patients with aneurysms to a greater degree than those with atherosclerosis or normal age-matched controls. So this enzyme is overproduced within the tissue. Uh, it's not meant to imply that there's a, a disease at a distance, but that the uh, elevated blood levels are really a marker of aneurysm disease. So over the years, a number of animal models have been described, and I'm uh, tasked with focusing on the elastase-induced model um, uh, that was developed to uh, induce aneurysms, and I want to talk about some of the details of that, uh, but also to acknowledge uh, the calcium chloride-induced model, which is an, a model where the uh, artery is exposed externally to calcium chloride on the external surface, and then over a period of several weeks develops an inflammatory response, elastin destruction, and dilatation. Uh, and Alan uh, is going to talk about the angiotensin infusion model, which he discovered, so I'm not going to uh, mention that further. Um, the elastase model was first developed in rats uh, by uh, Sammy Anatar from Paris, and uh, this is a model whereby the uh, aortic uh, 
uh, the abdominal aortic segment was infused with a dilute elastase solution internally, so within the isolated segment. This sketch uh, illustrates what we do with a mouse, uh, but is very similar where we isolate a segment of the inferenal aorta with ligatures and then cannulate that segment, uh, creating a closed system and instill a dilute elastase solution to create an injury to the aortic wall uh, that then over time develops into an aneurysm. And I'll talk about some of the diameter changes then that occur. This slide summarizes uh, many years using the mouse model. And in the mouse model, we use a very dilute solution of elastase. This is pancreatic elastase from Sigma. And uh, it's a perfusion for only five minutes, so it's a very brief exposure. You do see a 50% increase in the diameter of the aorta after the technique, after this perfusion event. That occurs as soon as you take off uh, the ligatures and restore blood flow, but that occurs regardless of the solution that you infuse. So if we use saline as a control or heat inactivated elastase, you still get 50% dilatation. However, in the controls, the diameter stays at 50% for up to two weeks and even thereafter, uh, it doesn't increase. And in the experimental group with elastase, uh, there continues to be increased diameter and between 10 and 14 days after the elastase exposure, uh, the aorta dilates more than 100% the normal diameter. So that's what we use as our threshold uh, to define an aortic aneurysm. The histologic changes here are quite interesting, actually, in that we perfuse with an elastase solution, and the initial notion was to damage the elastic lamellae and then allow the aneurysm for to form. But histologically, even three days after the elastase, the elastic lamellae are actually quite intact. And we can show only by electron microscopy that there's damage to the elastic structure from the elastase perfusion. The elastase itself is not the only enzyme in an elastase preparation, and there may be other matrix components damaged by this that contribute. Uh, later on, we see an inflammatory infiltrate develop, and that usually begins by day 7 and is maximal between day 10 and 14 when diameter increases the most. And this inflammatory infiltrate is associated with the uh, immunolocalization of MMP9 producing macrophages, increased tissue levels of MMP9, mRNA, and protein. And so this model served to uh, suggest that the inflammatory response and the subsequent destruction of elastic lamellae uh, after that was responsible for the elastin or for the uh, aneurysm formation. And this corresponded to the notion that we had of human aneurysm disease. And so we thought this served as a very good model, not necessarily at this level, but out here at the uh, day 7 to 14 range. And, and that's a convenient time interval to do studies with a mouse model. So this looked like a very convenient way to uh, pursue. <coughs> In terms of how this model actually works, one of the hypotheses is that the chemical or enzymatic destruction of elastin at a subtle layer level results not only in just the structural changes to elastic fibers, but also the release of an enormous amount of low molecular weight elastin degradation products or peptides. These peptides have biological activity and are known to be quite chemotactic for fibroblasts and inflammatory cells. And so the idea is that this influx of high concentration of EDPs uh, in the aortic wall results in then the inflammatory response, or at least is one of the main signals uh, to the subsequent inflammatory response. And that other enzymes produced by the inflammatory cells are actually responsible for the matrix degradation that results in aneurysm formation. In our earliest studies using the mouse model, we uh, quickly turned to uh, pharmacologic inhibition of MMPs and genetically altered mice to try and test the fundamental hypothesis that MMPs, and particularly MMP9, might drive aneurysm repair. And this slide summarizes our initial studies using doxycycline as a nonspecific MMP inhibitor, in this case given uh, systemically in the drinking water to mice. And you can see the suppression of aneurysm diameter or dilatation on day 14 compared to the control mice treated with saline alone or regular drinking water. Um, and also in MMP9 knockout mice, which we had available to us through Steve Shapiro and Bill Parks at Washington University, we also showed a very comparable, similar suppression of aneurysm formation in these uh, mice. So uh, MMP9 gene deficiency uh, was a more specific way to test uh, the effects of MMP9 itself and uh, prove that uh, 
for the first time, a single gene mutation could actually alter the susceptibility to aneurysm formation. The histology uh, in these animals shows in the control mice a marked destruction of the elastic lamellae day 14 after elastin, and whether they're treated with doxycycline or have genetic deficiency in MMP9, uh, the elastic lamellae are well preserved 14 days later. And so this corresponds to the notion that MMPs, particularly MMP9, drive the destruction of elastin. And so this has led to a number of other initiatives, particularly with tetracyclines as potential inhibitors. I know Tim Baxter is going to talk a little bit later about the potential clinical trial with doxycycline. And it's interesting to point out that doxycycline and other tetracyclines have this dual activity in the chemical structure. Uh, the antibiotic activity resides in this part of the, uh, the molecule. And if that's removed, you can create a tetracycline that has no antibiotic activity. But it does retain the ability to inhibit MMPs chemically because that resides in a different part of the tetracycline nucleus. So this has led to the development in, in some cases of chemically modified tetracyclines that still have the MMP inhibiting properties but not the uh, antibiotic activity. And tetracyclines uh, may serve as a very useful broad spectrum MMP inhibiting approach. Uh, you can see that in other models of aneurysm disease, I think this is virtually uh, all the models I'm, I'm aware of of aneurysm disease uh, that have been used uh, extensively. In each one of them, uh, doxycycline has proven to be uh, suppressive for aneurysm formation, uh, whether the initial injury is calcium chloride, elastase, or angiotensin-induced uh, aneurysms. And even in fibrillin-1 deficient Marfan mice, uh, doxycycline, as Tim Baxter has shown, uh, can suppress aneurysm formation and death of those mice. So tetracycline inhibition is a, a kind of a broad principle uh, by which to inhibit MMPs and aneurysm formation. And this really arose out of these uh, first studies with uh, mouse models. Now this complicated slide illustrates kind of our current overview of the mouse model, the elastase-induced model, where injury to the aorta occurs here on day zero and over this 14-day time course, you get a sequence of different changes that occur in the tissue. So over the years, our studies have migrated from looking at MMPs uh, that are the uh, effector enzymes of elastin destruction between day 10 and day 14, and trying to better understand some of the earlier events in the pathophysiologic sequence, uh, both from the enzymes that are produced, which also include serine proteases and cathepsins, uh, to the cell types that produce them, mostly involved in a chronic inflammatory response. But that's not just macrophages, and it also does include T cells, and to some degree, a poorly understood immune response, which remains to be uh, better studied. Uh, we also are looking at intracellular signaling pathways that affect the production of these effector enzymes and the inflammatory signaling cascades. Uh, one of the uh, molecules that we studied uh, in this respect is interleukin-6. Uh, this uh, caught our attention from studies done by others, as shown here, which demonstrated a marked increase in the amount of interleukin-6 that was produced in tissues from patients with aneurysms compared to normal aortic tissue, and the production of uh, interleukin-6 actively by these tissues in explant culture, the elevation of interleukin-6 in the blood, uh, and even studies showing that a catheter in the aortic uh, lumen withdrawn through an aneurysm would show higher levels of interleukin-6 distal to the aneurysm or downstream than it would higher, showing or suggesting production of interleukin-6 within the tissue. Uh, so we began to study interleukin-6 uh, several years ago with our mouse model uh, following the studies we had done in a number of other genetically altered mice. And this shows that uh, compared to the control group where aneurysms form uh, by day 14 quite nicely, there's marked suppression in animals that are uh, deficient uh, in interleukin-6. If you uh, take uh, antibodies to interleukin-6 shown here uh, to neutralize uh, this uh, cytokine, you can also affect the same degree of suppression. Uh, and you can reverse this in interleukin-6 knockout mice by administering interleukin-6. Uh, in this case, we've done this with a localized pump uh, and a catheter tip next to the aorta delivering uh, interleukin-6. Uh, in interleukin-6 deficient mice, showing you can now restore susceptibility to aneurysms. Uh, and this slide illustrates the histology demonstrating uh, marked preservation of uh, the aortic elastic lamellae in interleukin-6 deficient mice, again confirming 
that interleukin-6 is probably uh, part of the cascade leading to MMP9 production and elastin degradation. Uh, and so further work in this area is directed towards understanding the intracellular pathways by which interleukin-6 signals through its receptor and a co-receptor, GP130, and then the downstream stat activation and phosphorylation cascades that really mediate the effects of interleukin-6 and its family members. Another signaling cascade that's been of interest is uh, uh, that of uh, C-June N-terminal kinase, which is a intracellular mediator that leads to the activation of AP1, which then activates a number of different genes and also suppresses some genes. So some of the genes AP1 activates are, uh, include MMP2 and MMP9, and this uh, now famous study uh, illustrates uh, very nicely um, the suppression of MMP production in uh, mice treated with a JNK inhibitor and the suppression of aneurysms in two different animal models as well as the production, increased production of enzymes involved in matrix production and matrix repair, putting a new twist on uh, the uh, suppression of aneurysm formation uh, by enhancing matrix repair and simultaneously uh, inhibiting destruction. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is just some work more upstream at signaling uh, at the angiotensin level, uh, where angiotensin may be one of the most proximate mediators. And, our interest in angiotensin arose out of Alan Doherty's work using angiotensin infusion in APOE knockout mice, demonstrating a new uh, novel model of aneurysm disease that he's going to present. Um, but angiotensin uh, can be activated after a variety of different vascular injuries, so we're interested in whether the elastase induced model might actually involve some of these same pathways and whether angiotensin uh, might actually be involved in our model. And so uh, with the use of angiotensin 1 receptor knockout mice, we demonstrated a marked suppression in the 14-day uh, dilatation of uh, aortas in uh, mice uh, after elastase perfusion. So we can use this model now to demonstrate um, effects based on this receptor. And uh, this is the main receptor activated by angiotensin 2 on the cell surface. Uh, heterozygotes had an intermediate uh, suppression. Uh, angiotensin II receptor knockout mice had no protection uh, compared to wild-type mice. So this uh, really showed that the angiotensin I receptor played a key role even in this uh, elastase-induced model. And this was associated as well with preservation of the elastin and suppression of the inflammatory response, suggesting that the angiotensin signaling pathway plays a very proximate uh, level role in this model and uh, then potentially, again, in human aneurysm disease. One of the other agents uh, available for clinical use and widely used in the treatment of blood pressure is losartan, uh, which is an angiotensin I receptor antagonist. And so we also wanted to look at the opportunity that we might have to use losartan as a uh, pharmacologic uh, means to suppress aneurysms. And uh, using mice treated with uh, saline here compared to angiotensin infusion in our model, we actually found no enhancement of aneurysms but we found marked suppression in those treated with losartan. So we could affect uh, pharmacologically the same effect. Uh, maintaining a blood pressure the same uh, as losartan treated animals with hydralazine, however, resulted in no effect. So controlling for hemodynamic effects actually uh, didn't change uh, this outcome. And losartan is now in clinical trial uh, based on other work uh, in uh, Marfan syndrome. Again, uh, work that started with uh, mouse models of Marfan syndrome uh, and uh, suppression of aneurysms in those uh, models with losartan treatment. So losartan is now an active clinical trial um, uh, based on work by Hal Dietz and others uh, in, in Marfan syndrome. Uh, one of the other aspects we're interested in is uh, inflammatory cells other than macrophages. And with Guping Shi at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, we've previously done work on mast cells and are currently quite interested in the role that neutrophils might play. We traditionally assign neutrophils a very minimal role in aneurysm disease, thinking of this as a disease of chronic inflammation uh, where neutrophils are not frequently seen. Uh, there are neutrophils present in human aneurysm tissue. We can identify them by immunolocalization. And we also see in this very time-regulated animal model of aneurysm disease that neutrophils come in quite early, and we can identify and count them uh, very well. So if we use animals that have been depleted of neutrophils uh, 
uh, with cobra venom, vi uh, vi uh, cobra venom factor or other means, we can actually prevent the development of aneurysms uh, shown here. Uh, and uh, we can also suppress the subsequent development of macrophage infiltration. So we think that neutrophils play an early and essential role in this model um, because they promote the further influx of other inflammatory cells, particularly macrophages. And it may well be that targeting neutrophils in human aneurysm disease uh, may still have a role. And so some of the molecular steps in that process are important to understand. Most of our work has uh, involved looking at the enzymes involved in neutrophil migration and recruitment. And DPP-1, also known as cathepsin C, is an important enzyme in this process. And some of our recent work has involved using mice deficient in this critical uh, enzyme in the lysosome of neutrophils um, to see how these neutrophil serine proteases might uh, play a role. And uh, in DPP-1 deficient mice, we can demonstrate nice suppression of aneurysm formation uh, and show that this is really related to neutrophil activation of serine proteases that are produced in lysosomes. So we've identified uh, and studied a number of different uh, molecular and pathophysiologic pathways involved in aneurysm disease um, using this model, and I think the elastase model is very versatile. The last thing I'd like to do is just touch on one of the more recent directions that our laboratory has taken and that's to begin studying some of the things that Frank uh, leaderly alluded to with respect to epidemiologic risk factors for aneurysms. One of the most potent risk factors, as you know, is tobacco exposure or cigarette smoking. In fact, the, most, uh, the strongest epidemiologic risk factor for aneurysm disease. So one of the important links is uh, the disease of emphysema that results from cigarette smoking is a disease of elastin destruction. You can see the gaps in the uh, emphyseminous lung produced by the loss of elastin. And many of the same pathophysiologic mechanisms that we study in aneurysms were really identified earlier in studies on emphysema. The role of macrophages, the role of proteases that can degrade elastin, particularly MMP9. And so uh, this has uh, been an interesting link that we've uh, wished to study further uh, in uh, a more experimental manner. So we tried to develop over the years a link between mouse models of emphysema produced by cigarette smoke, ideally, and our mouse model of aneurysms with elastase. And so we actually borrowed from work done by Steve Shapiro's laboratory at Washington University, where they have a very well-developed, well-characterized cigarette smoke-induced model of uh, emphysema. Uh, these mice are exposed to uh, three cigarettes for one hour every six or six days out of the week and uh, develop uh, over six months of exposure, uh, quite pronounced uh, pulmonary emphysema, histologically and uh, in terms of pulmonary function testing. Um, these mice are resistant to emphysema if they are deficient in MMP12, another elastin degrading uh, MMP. Um, and so uh, we uh, sought to combine this model with our elastase-induced model and try and uh, elicit uh, some way to study the effects of cigarette smoking in a more refined manner. In our first studies, published a number of years ago, we found that if mice had been smoking for two weeks prior to elastin or elastase perfusion, we saw no difference uh, in the extent of aneurysmal dilatation two weeks later after elastase. If we followed similar mice, however, longer and went out to 12 weeks, we actually found that the smoking mice or smoke-exposed mice had marked increase in aneurysm size compared to those who had been followed for 12 weeks exposed only to room air. So we could finally uh, demonstrate a marked enhancement in aneurysm size uh, based solely on the exposure to cigarette smoke. Now my colleague John Kirchy has been studying this uh, under uh, funding from the Flight Attendants Research uh, Association and uh, he has modified the model in an important manner where rather than using the standard dose of elastase that characteristically produces aneurysms in all of our wild type and control mice, he's lowered the dose of elastase perfused to a level that really doesn't produce aneurysms in control mice and then subsequently exposed those animals to cigarette smoking. So a standard dose of elastase, there's no significant difference between smoking and non-smoking mice. But in low dose elastase where the control mice non-smoking really develop minimal dilatation, just reaching 100% at two weeks. Uh, there's a marked increase in uh, diameter at two weeks in those who smoke. 
And so we can now use this model. And John has actually shown, uh, most interestingly and, and most recently, that if you use these mice uh, with this low-dose elastase modification of the model and treat them with doxycycline, the smoking mice have no suppression uh, of the uh, aneurysm formation compared to the control mice. So uh, this is a new twist that suggests that uh, a treatment that's otherwise been successful in all other models of aneurysm disease, including the elastase model, at least at standard dose, hasn't abolished the smoking-induced in enhancement of aneurysms. He's now going on to use MMP9 and MMP12 knockout mice and shown the same lack of effects. So mice lacking those enzymes are capable of getting aneurysms if they're exposed to cigarette smoke. So this suggests for the first time that the mechanisms of aneurysm formation in smoking mice uh, are not MMP dependent, either MMP9, MMP12, or when using doxycycline in a broad spectrum, uh, and that other enzymes may be involved in the smoking-induced component uh, to aneurysm formation. So uh, this challenges us to try and understand this a lot better at a molecular level uh, to make further progress on how to devise treatments. So all in all, um, I think the use of the elastase-induced model, and, and many of you are using this model, I know you've come to our laboratory and trained, and our laboratory is open to anyone who wishes to learn this model. Uh, we enjoy teaching it. We have a great team that, that can do this very effectively. Um, I think uh, once one overcomes some technical hurdles in trying to learn it, it's a very, very reproducible uh, and a versatile model for uh, studying aneurysm disease in a variety of different manipulations with mice. And I'd like to thank my co-investigators and uh, colleagues, particularly John Kirchhey, who's done the most recent work on smoking mice. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So that's a very brief overview of a really extensive body of work that Rob has conducted over many years to identify some of the most important mechanisms in aortic aneurysm disease. And the smoking part, I think, is some of the most intriguing and probably clinically relevant of all. It's an interesting addition here at the end. I, I think in our, in our SCORE project, you know, as I said, we've screened over a thousand uh, small aneurysm patients have been in, they're not, they're not identified through screening. They have a known aneurysm. They're screened for participation in our program. And we found that in that cohort in, in Northern California, only about 20% are still smoking at the time that they're being evaluated for participation in our study. Other estimates have varied between as high as 50% of patients are still smoking at the time of aneurysm diagnosis. So, so I, I, it's, it remains to be seen, I guess, how important the smoking factor is going to necessarily be in treating someone who has a recognized aneurysm if they're not actually smoking at the time the aneurysm is recognized. But on the other hand, it's obviously it's essential, five to seven-fold increase in risk for smokers to develop aneurysm. So the timeline of aneurysm pathogenesis, even in the years before an aneurysm is even apparent, is probably the most critical time that smoking is really an issue in aneurysm disease. Does anybody have uh, questions for Rob? Yes, Susan. Dr. Ray. Um, a lot of good results shown with the elastase model in rodent species in particular, but I know in other species, which, you know, sometimes there's work that can't really be done very easily in rats and mice, that there's been mixed results with elastase, and I've seen several variations looking at elastase and collagenase, for instance, together, um, using balloon injury as well as the enzyme infusion with some different results out there, and I was wondering if you've had any experience or thoughts on different species approaches to trying to use the same model? Yeah, I think there's been quite a bit of interest in trying to ramp up the elastase model to particularly the larger uh, animals, pigs, dogs, so that you could have a model of uh, aneurysm disease that might be applicable to uh, applications with device studies. And that's been actually pretty challenging. Um, early on, we tried to create similar aneurysms in rabbits and then ultimately actually in pigs as well with elastase perfusion and found that we really couldn't reproduce the model in the same way. Um, when you use a very high concentration of elastase, I guess this really is mostly in pigs, um, and uh, calcium chloride outside the vessel, you can affect enough destruction to get aneurysmal dilatation, but that's quite acute. So immediately after reperfusion, you can have an aneurysm, but that type of acute injury, abrupt aneurysm formation, really doesn't reproduce the same 
uh, changes that occur in the mouse over two weeks, where you've got a, a little bit slower progression of a chronic inflammatory response with likely different enzymes being produced that actually mediate the destruction of elastin. So the major difference we find is that in, in the model as we currently use it, uh, it actually requires this time lag, this period. And, and the important part of the model is actually what occurs over time. Uh, and so an acute <coughs> formation of an aneurysm, regardless of how the injury is formed, probably isn't the same biology at all. Um, so I'm not sure that's much of an improvement over even just a prosthetic sac uh, in the aortic circulation uh, in terms of studying how a stent graft, for example, might influence the biology of the aortic neck uh, and some of the other questions that have been studied over the years. Um, that's still a frustration. Uh, I know that a number of groups have tried to reproduce the same sequence of pathophysiology uh, with different enzymes and such. and. It ha I know of no model where that's really been affected yet. Uh, Dr. Norman, Paul, did you have a question, Paul? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, have you looked at smoking alone? Does smoking alone do anything to the aorta? Um, no, we don't see any changes in structure or in aortic diameter or size um, in uh, smoking. Mice just exposed to smoke, even. Uh, for mice that went six months, uh, for example, to develop pulmonary emphysema, where we've then looked at the aortic tissue from those animals, we don't really see any differences in the um, structure or in the amount of uh, MMP9 produced. We have looked at that particularly. We didn't see any changes. So does that concern you in terms of the sort of validity of the model? Well, I, I think uh, only in that we've shown uh, that you can enhance aneurysm formation with the addition of smoking. Um, I'm not sure that smoking is the only causative factor in humans either. Uh, I think it's probably just one of several and um, you know as a risk factor isolating it in the way that we can with this this modified elastase model with the smoking mice really allows us to isolate that factor alone and and study what what mechanisms does smoking uh, involve that might enhance the disease. So I think from an experimental point of view, it, it's actually wonderful. Um, in trying to come to a global understanding of causation of aneurysms, I don't know that that advances the, the ball down the field much more. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> Rob get can I get ask a follow-up question on that? Yes, Larry. Did Dr. you try either anti-IL-6 or anti-angiotensin-1 receptor blockade in your smoking mice? Does it block? We've not done that yet. We've not studied IL-6 yet in the smoking mice. News to come. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Tolanay. A question about Lucertin. First of all, thank you for the nice summary of the elastase model. Was the Lucertin treatment after the development of aneurysm or uh, before elastase treatment? In the data I showed, that study was done uh, starting Lucertin in the drinking water the day of elastase perfusion and just continuing that for the, the two-week period. Most of our studies uh, with this model, uh, we treat pharmacologically from, from that day forward. Um, it's a little bit harder in this elastase-induced model to study the, the established aneurysm. Um, we, we don't have imaging methods that are quite as accurate enough to measure changes in size uh, in these very small aortas. So it's hard for us to do longitudinal studies uh, accurately in this model. Um, uh, the study we'd love to do is to have, you know, the animal at two weeks or, or four weeks and then treat them at that point and look for regression. Um, but our imaging methods haven't really had the resolution to measure the incremental changes that we need to, to do that yet. Uh, just as a com side comment of that, that's one of our interests here at Stanford, uh, particularly as part of our uh, aneurysm research group is to develop more sensitive imaging methods to track aneurysm progression. And if that may be an issue that we can discuss during the, the Clark Center tour, if anyone's interested, we have some experience with high frequency ultrasound and other methods of, of uh, progression. Uh, we, can, we have time for a few more questions. Yes, our colleagues from Yamaguchi University, Dr. Yoshimura. Uh, uh, 
Uh, thank you for a beautiful talk and uh, mentioning on our uh, work on Sijun and terms of kindness. And uh, so my question is that uh, the current hypothesis for the, uh, the pathogenesis of AAA is that uh, the hemodynamic stress is the major driving force of the pathogenesis, right? So uh, could you comment on the effect of hemodynamic stress on your Elastis model or any other uh, Angma models? Well, I, I guess my view would be that that's one of several different initiating and propagating factors for the disease. Um, as we've used this model, we haven't really applied it much to study hemodynamic stress. Uh, Dr. Dahlman can address that question with much more rigor and, and data. Um, <laughs> so that's not something that we've really studied in our hands with this model. I know Ron has used the same model, though. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, as you know, that's uh, one of our interests, and uh, that's the whole reason that we got into our interest in exercise is a possible, uh, uh, you know, potent mediator of progression of small aneurysm disease. It was based on our experience with originally the elastase model and then subsequently other models, originally creating arteriovenous fistulae or doing distal ligations and showing how that modified progression of the model and more recently actually exercising mice. Uh, if you put a mouse in a wheel in a cage and give it unlimited access to the cage, it'll run five kilometers a day. And so we can actually generate some substantial exercise impact. And one of our posters at the poster session this week is talking, we actually have a couple of posters at the poster session talking about the clear impact that exercise makes on the progression of experimental models. So actually during the course of this meeting, there's many, many talks on the potential hemodynamic influences of, of stress, strain, uh, tangential strain, um, uh, uh, strains that are applied to both along the, the lumen as well as perpendicular to the lumen. And, and I think the context of the meeting, that question will be addressed in much more uh, detail. Uh, we're a little bit behind. One more question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Thompson. I'm going to keep my questions brief. Um, oh, do any of these mice die after elastase infusion? Um, like in the angiotensin II model, you know that it's like um, mortality of almost 20% in the first week from aortic rupture. That's number one. Number two, I noticed in one of your slides that um, in the cellular infiltrate, day 10 and day 14, you had T helper 1 and then T, T helper 2 and um, gamma interferon at day 14. You know, one of the groups from Boston kind of showed the importance of T helper 1 and 2 ratio uh, being decreased in human aneurysms. Uh, did you look at the ratio of these cells um, in your model? And um, well, what is your f uh, feeling about MMP2 and MMP9, which is more important? I mean, I read a lot of papers stating one is more important than the other. And uh, my last question is, uh, what, what would happen, right I'm sorry. <laughs> You, you can answer this later if you want. But uh, what would happen if you give exogenous IL-6 to wild-type mice with and without elastase? Uh, you must have showed that. Uh, I probably missed it. Thank you. Actually, the last one's easy because I showed this that. This is the microphone uh, that works around this one. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and uh, we, saw, we saw no effect in aneurysm dilatation. Um, we have... Uh, done a little work in studying the, uh, the cellular immune response in our model, as well as in human aneurysm disease. And I think our conclusions are uh, more along the lines that we believe a Th1 type response may be more pathogenic or contribute to the disease, and that a Th2 response has some features that may be suppressive. Um, I know that's a contradistinction to some other findings, and I don't know that that's really a resolved question. Um, there are data from our uh, laboratory using this model, from Tim Baxter's laboratory using the calcium chloride model that support the uh, destructive effects of the Th1 response in these aneurysm models. Um, and our data align with, with what he's shown. So I think um, uh, I, I would favor that hypothesis that, that there is certainly an importance of the Th1, Th2 balance. Um, but we don't really know uh, that fully yet and have all the data. Uh, there are also other aspects of that cellular immune response, even a T17 response that uh, is only beginning to be studied well. So I think there are other uh, twists to that immunologic story that now are only beginning to be uh, developed. Um, First question was what again? I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, that's an important technical aspect of this model, and I think a distinct difference between the angiotensin model. We actually don't see rupture of these aneurysms very frequently at all, uh, hardly ever within that first 14-day period. The, the deaths that occur, which are in our hands now about 5% or less of the animals that undergo the procedure, and then that's anesthesia and technical. It's always anesthesia. Uh, <laughs> Clinically uh, and experimentally, yeah. that's right. We've reproduced that. So. Uh, but <laughs> but um, we don't see rupture or death uh, within that two-week period. And if we follow these aneurysms over several months, and, and we've really followed them only out as far as six months, I think, is the longest we've looked at, and only small numbers of animals, uh, but they rarely rupture. We've only had a few out at long periods of time that actually died from rupture. So it's not a good model of aneurysm rupture. And I think for those that are contemplating what model to use in their laboratory, that's an important thing to know. So I just we, we need to move on. And I, I just want to point out that we also use this model, use it for many years. And Rob's being a little bit modest. A 5% mortality rate for creating this model is, I don't think anyone else achieves that. We've used this model for at least, in the mice, for at least five years. And the rats, 10. We're at about, our lab's pretty stable at about 10% operative mortality. It technically can be challenging. But once you've got a system in place where you've got the anesthesia, you got the right concentration in the last days, it's, it's actually a, it's a stable platform. It's very useful in that regard. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.